Are we all together again? I hope so. For away we go. Please look at the sheet headed Puritan Spirituality. Uh, it's on the back of Puritan Concerns. What we're doing now is digging into the reality of the Puritan identity. As you see, that's the first heading on the sheet. And by identity, I mean the way in which the Puritans saw themselves. That's the top level, the conscious level of identity. And I mean, second, the way that the Puritans really were which wasn't necessarily any different from the way that they saw themselves, but which might in fact strike you as going deeper, um, the deeper dimensions of any sense of identity or any point of view only get seen, I think you'll agree, after it's all over when historians look back and they see more of the game than the people who were playing it at the time saw. Uh, if an outline like what you have on this sheet had been put to a Puritan, uh, I think it would have taken him a little time to appreciate that all this was true of him. Though I think that I could have shown him that, yes, it is. This is you and your friends that I'm profiling, nobody else. And I think that the Puritan uh, would in due course have seen it. But now let's look at it and you'll see, I think, what I mean. Puritan identity straight away is capsuled in the phrase pilgrims in conflict. You have heard at least of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which became a bestseller and uh, a tremendous uh, influence for good from the year of its appearance, 1678, I think that was. Um, why did it ring so many bells so quickly? Why? Because the Puritan sense of identity, sorry, the Pilgrim sense of identity was so fundamental to the Puritan mindset. We live as travelers through this world heading for home. Life in this world is important because it's preparation for an even more important life which will never end um, and for which we are in training now. That's God's philosophy of, um, God's philosophy of Christianity. That's what the Puritans thought. So we're all pilgrims, travelers, and all Puritan theology takes the form of a traveler's guide. And the words in conflict are added because it was also part of the Puritan conviction that no one can make spiritual progress without finding that sin and Satan and the world, world, the flesh and the devil, are one way or another against them and so that they have to do battle in order to make, in, in, in order to make, to make advance. And the Puritans produced some classic writings on spiritual conflict, just as they did on, uh, the, Pur on, uh, on the pilgrim life. Uh, for instance, I gave you a name for the pilgrim life. I spoke of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress from this world to the next. Uh, I'll give you a name also on the spiritual conflict theme. Um, William Gurnall, G-U-R-N-A-L-L, -L, The Christian in Complete Armor, which is the fruit of about 15 years of sermons on the uh, Christian conflict section in Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20. Uh, the Puritans harnessed great cartloads of divinity to single texts. Uh, because the cartloads of divinity dealt with the themes to which the texts referred. It was a form of exposition which can't be dismissed as illegitimate. It really is exposition. It's digging into the implications of the particular texts. On the other hand, uh, it does make for very fulsome exposition and very slow progress. 
Well, anyway, um, there is Gurnall's Christian in Complete Armour, more than 800 pages of small print. Uh, you may like to look that up at some stage. Now, under the heading, the Puritan Identity, you see two subheadings. A, History of Puritanism. Well, I've given you all of that that uh, I propose to give you. Um, the Heavenly Vision, now that is, that's only preparation for studying the Puritan history. The heavenly vision has to do with the ideals that forced the Puritans to live as they did and supported them and kept them going when they met the tremendous opposition they did meet. You see five words there. Biblicist, pietist, churchly, too worldly and dramatic. And then the noun outlook. Uh, which all five adjectives qualify. What does this mean? Well, as you suspected, the word biblicist means that the Puritans were great Bible students and they took their faith most diligently and meticulously from the Word of God and they were, frankly, the leaders in biblical study in their own day by a large margin. Everything must be in accordance with the scriptures. That was uh, basic to the Puritan mindset. And uh, the Bible has in it a lot of detail. Uh, well, yes, but um, God expects us to master it because it's his word and he's our God and our Lord. At this point, I will tell you a little story. Um, Richard Rogers, an Elizabethan Puritan, was out riding in the 1570s or 1580s, and the lord of the manor caught up with him, and they fell into conversation. Rogers was a Puritan in the days when Puritans were given other derogatory names as well as Puritan, uh, and one of the derogatory names was Precision. They were also incidentally called Gehenians, the Hellfire people at that time. Well, the Lord of the Manor, uh, at some point in the conversation, said to Richard Roger, you're a good guy and I like you and I like, uh, uh, I, I, I like your influence and so on, but <clears throat> you're a precision and you're like a lot of other people who are precisions. Why are you religiously so precise, you lot. And Rogers came back with the unanswerable reply, oh sir, he said, I serve, we serve a precise God. Well, that's the Puritan spirit. We serve a precise God who has revealed his mind precisely in Holy Scripture and it's up to us to master that revelation precisely and not to grudge any of the hard work and hard study that that task requires of us. The word pietist, printed under Biblicist, could perhaps be misunderstood, so let me explain it. Pietism was a word which began to be used in the 18th century for people who believed that our relationship with God is, that is, our piety as a way of life, is the most important thing in those lives of ours and the thing, the reality, to which we must give closest attention. Well, you say, isn't that just standard Christianity? My reply is, I think it should be for everybody. But pietism earned its name at a time when the pietists were trying to keep the priority of personal godliness alive in state churches where concerned, concern about personal piety had very much diminished. What was asked for simply was correctness as um, an Anglican or a Lutheran or in the state church. Uh, turn up to church on Sunday and uh, don't rock the boat and uh, pay your dues so that the church can keep going and that's that. 
In an age like that, pietism, as you can see, was an emphasis very much needed. Well, the first pietists who went by that name were in Lutheran Germany, men with names like um, uh, oh golly. Did you know that when you get to my age, which I'm not revealing at the moment, every now and then you have senior moments in which things that you knew perfectly well go from you. And the names of the, the two German pietists that I, was going to, uh, that I was going to reel off have just gone. Sorry about that. Who, yes, go, come on, who, who, German pietists, please help me. Spainer, yes, thank you, that's one. And um, uh, what's the, what was the, what's the name of the man who founded the orphanages at, in Halle? Spainer and, um, oh. Sorry about this, you, you, never, I, you never know when it's going to happen. And I, didn't, I, I didn't write it down because I thought, uh, yes, I know that. Well, anyway, men like Spainer came to be called pietists because they wrote to establish the point that our relationship with God must come first. And um, evangelicalism in, in uh, the Western world since the 18th century is rightly called a pietist movement. There are people for whom pietism is uh, a word of dismissal. They are the people who, for themselves, don't regard our relationship with God as the matter of most importance in our lives. But don't be put off by that. Pietist is a very, and pietism, they are very noble words. And so it's proper to say that the leaders of the evangelical awakening uh, in England, people like Wesley and Whitfield, people uh, equally who led the great awakening in, uh, New, in New England in the 1740s, um, 1730, late 30s and 40s, people with names like Jonathan Edwards, you know that name I'm sure, and Freilinghausen, or Freilinghausen, I'm not sure how he pronounced it, um, who was a revivalist in New York, and various people like that, they are properly called pietists, and so is Charles Spurgeon, and so is D.L. Moody, and so are people like Hudson Taylor, the missionary pioneer, and George Muller, the uh, English founder of orphanages that maintain themselves, in the special sense of the phrase, by faith. You you've know, know about George Muller, I'm sure. Uh, these people may properly be called pietists, and so may 20th century figures like Billy Graham and Martin Lloyd-Jones. The Puritans were all pietists. There was no question what came first for them, um, a, a concern which we may summarize in the phrase, knowing God. And then third adjective is churchly. We are used in these days to a pietism which is parachurchly, seems to have, if not all, at least most of its life, not in the ongoing activities of local churches Sunday by Sunday, but in the, at surface level, more exciting activities of parachurch movements which are fulfilling specialist forms of ministry to particular targeted groups of people. Well, the Puritans were churchly pietists. They believed that the renewal of the church so that the church in its corporate life might glorify God, that must be the goal of every Christian. That's uh, the beginning of the meaning of thy kingdom come in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, they were church men, as we would say, or, well, those of us who know the old-fashioned word church men would say. Um, they were church men to their fingertips, always concerned about the glory of God in the church, never forgetting the church, by which they meant the institutional church, never forgetting the institutional church um, in their uh, excitement about parachurch activities and institutions 
uh, as is so often the case with us today. And from this standpoint, they saw themselves as seeking to continue the work of reforming the church, which the first generation of reformers had started. And uh, they were very concerned to, with the question of what form the ideal church according to the scriptures would take and so the ecclesiology of not just um, evangelical Anglicans, but uh, Presbyterians, Baptists, Congregationalists, uh, all these ecclesiologies were hammered out by Puritans uh, in the course of the late 16th and 17th centuries. Then under Churchly, you've got the world, you've got the word too worldly, and that indeed carries, that carries the thought which I uh, hinted at clearly enough, I think, when I spoke of the, uh, <clears throat> when I spoke of the um, pilgrim perspective right at the beginning of this uh, second, second part of today's, t today's class. Yes, um, heaven is supremely important and the Lord's people are called to head for heaven and to live their life in this world as a kind of training for heaven in which they practice, learn to master all the aspects of communion with God that are going to be fulfilled in heaven. Uh, more about that uh, later on in the course. And then the dramatic outlook, uh, this is an internalizing among evangelical Christians of something which was happening in the secular culture, as we would call it, that is the world outside the churches. It was happening as a result of the, re the renaissance of the 15th and 16th centuries in Western Europe. Uh, it was happening in uh, theaters and among poets. Uh, you find it mirrored in Shakespeare. What was happening was that personal self-consciousness was being deepened, deepened by discussion, deepened by self-questioning, deepened by all sorts of relational interchanges, which pulled out of people more self-awareness than they'd had before. And as I said, this is something which you see happening in the culture. And if you want to, if you, if you, if you want to see it crystallized or mirrored, well, Shakespeare's play Hamlet does that as well as uh, any other document from the period. Hamlet is the perfect late Renaissance character. Uh, you know those famous soliloquies in the drama where Ham Hamlet is set an impossible job to do. That's how it starts. Um, he's, got to, he's got to avenge his father's murder, and he's got to do, <coughs> he's, he's got to do it in a way that uh, fits certain parameters that are set by the ghost who gives him his commission. A and in the course of the play, Hamlet uh, utters a whole series of what are called his soliloquies, where he's just talking out loud to himself. And in those soliloquies, just about every certainty that um, Hamlet is pictured as having inherited is turned into a matter of uncertainty and doubt. And this is the, the growth of the dramatic inner selfhood Dramatic, because in drama there's always a clash of opposites and tensions and uh, alternate views pulling against each other. And increasingly, thoughtful people at the end of the 16th and through the 17th centuries experienced that. Experienced different views, options, possibilities, ideologies. Um, not exactly fighting each other, but pulling against each other uh, in their own inner lives. And so when the Puritans wrote about spiritual experience, 
they did so in a way which seems to the modern reader, who of course is even deeper into this dramatic outlook uh, than the Puritans were, but seems to the modern reader to be pretty much um, up to where he is in this regard. Whereas if you read religious materials produced prior to the middle of the 16th century, you feel that they come from an era of much less deep and searching self-awareness. That doesn't mean less sincerity, it just means that people didn't ask the questions which produce the bewilderments and sometimes torments and uh, uh, at, other, at other times visions and dreams and so on of the inner life. Well, these, um, the, these, these, these dramatic insights into life were linked for the Puritans with the constant conflicts that they saw as going on between the Christian and the world, the flesh and the devil, conflicts of which I spoke before. And this gives their work, the, this, this set of qualities together, gives their work a flavor which uh, I don't think really is matched anywhere else. So that was the heavenly vision by which they lived, that the sense that is of reality, of divine reality and of their own reality as persons seeking to enter into the kingdom of God. Um, and when you read their stuff, you realize, yes, this is who they were. To a very remarkable extent, Puritan authors form a single school of thought. There's hardly any respect in which they differ from each other for substance. They do differ from each other widely in the way that they express things and the uh, quality of their imagination and their logic and their expectations of their readers and all of that. Um, as we get on in the course, I will, when we talk about individual contributors to the Puritan legacy, I'll try to characterize them a bit further in, in that way. But now, having told you what it was that made them tick, that's really what I've been talking about, we have to hurry on. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to tell you anything more about the earthly battles that they fought, and at this stage, I'm not going to go into details about um, the factors shaping Puritanism beyond what I've said already. If you look, you see historical humanism of the Puritans. Well, there I'm talking about uh, the outward life and the inner life as they experienced it. And I think that if you brood on that set of headings, you will, appre you will appreciate what uh, you should expect when you read the Puritans, what they actually have um, as fellow human beings in Christ, that's their humanism, um, what they actually have to share. Nor am I going to say any more at this moment about their theological heritage, except that it was there. If you just look at my headings, well, you see, you see what's, what, what's down in the list. An Augustinian doctrine of grace, salvation is of the Lord. That's the Augustinian emphasis. A Lutheran doctrine of justification, acceptance with God is through faith by virtue of Christ's atoning death. I put down that they had a medieval concept of society Yes, uh, the Latin phrase that's in brackets there, corpus Christianum, the Christian body, points to the very organic sense which all medievals and heirs of medievalism um, had and felt, namely that society isn't what we feel it is, namely an anthill of individuals, but society is rather uh, an organic entity in which um, everybody lives together in a broad sense, everybody shares, and everybody has the feeling that um, the world goes on because we are all linked up with each other, uh, all part of the same ball of wax in some way. 
It's difficult to focus that mindset in uh, other than uh, cartoon language, but um, it was a big thing for the Puritans. And when you, when you read their stuff, you will be surprised at the uh, emphasis that they're constantly placing on the corporate, on the church as uh, an organic reality, and on society as an organic reality. It's still there with them. The Calvinish view of God's law is simply that the law of God is given not only to drive us to Christ as convicted sinners, but also to guide us in godly behavior once we are given to uh, God's service. Um, that's the famous third use of the law in Calvin's Institutes and for that matter in uh, the, the, the theology of um, Luther's uh, right-hand man, Melanchthon, who also talked about the third use of the law. First use is uh, to establish civil order in a Christian state, and the second use is to produce conviction of sin, driving a person to Christ. Then the third use is to act as a standard and a spur for the behavior of the saint. We'll have a whole session, I hope, on ministerial procedures of the Puritans, so I'm not going to go into that now. And as for Puritan piety, which I, this is heading to, which I call reformed monasticism because it was so firmly and um, uh, resolutely structured just as life in the monastery was firmly and resolutely structured. You know, there were um, half a dozen services in chapel to attend at set times. Um, there were silences imposed at set times. There were times for doing this, times for doing that. The Puritans brought that attitude to um, ordering one's life out into the secular world and part of their understanding of the discipline of personal godliness is that you do order your life, you plan your day, you set time apart for your, your prayer, your Bible study, your time with your family, uh, and so on and so on. So I think reformed monasticism is a phrase that gets quite, uh, quite some distance into the Puritan mindset. But I'm going to leave you at the moment to look through all these headings. Um, some of them uh, ring bells, which I've already been ringing, and some of them don't. But um, there is one thing that I want to do before we break. And so I'm leaving Puritan piety. I'm also leaving the review of Puritan concerns on the uh, reverse side of the sheet which I ask you to read through at your leisure. You'll find it um, dotting I's and crossing T's of things that I've already said. And I want to look with you at this long paragraph from John Geary's tract. It's only an eight-page tract. The character of an old English Puritan or nonconformist. Nonconformist means that uh, this was someone who didn't entirely toe the line of church requirements. Um, I want to read it. It's, as you see, a mid-17th century statement. I will make the minimum of comment on it to make sure that you understand all that's being said. This is a character profile. As a matter of fact, at this time in the world of letters, uh, drawing characters in words was a thing which any number of essayists did. A literary culture was developing in England and uh, doing characters was a regular part of it. John Geary here does the character of an old English Puritan or nonconformist. Old English because he's looking back to the way things were before the Civil War. He's writing of course in the middle of the Civil War in which as a matter of fact because though a Puritan in his godliness he had backed the king he had been bounced out of, his, uh, out of his pastorate and was living in retirement. 
There were all sorts of things that, uh, strange things that happened in the Civil War, as perhaps you already know. Anyway, he wrote this, and I'd like to read it through, and I'd like you to take it to heart. This is the archetypal Puritan character. The old English Puritan was such a one as honored God above all, and under God gave everyone his due. That's a way of saying he was a just man. Uh, giving everyone their due was the 17th century definition of justice. His first care was to serve God, and therein he did not what was good in his own, but in God's sight, making the word of God the rule of his worship. Uh, that refers back to the Puritan plea that some of the things that were in the prayer book, because uh, they were time-honored, although they hadn't got direct scriptural warrant, should be removed. Well, none of this was very important, so I haven't gone into any of it in any detail today, and I shan't in the course either. But uh, to the Puritans at the time, any even small um, addition to what was in the Bible seemed to them potentially unfaithful. You shouldn't add to what's in the Bible, you shouldn't subtract from it. And they had this idea that if you read your New Testament carefully, you could find in it everything that ought to be part of Christian worship and uh, nothing more. And nothing more ought to be added to that. Um, perhaps I should tell you that in the Elizabethan era, the something more which was added by the prayer book uh, gave offence at four points. The prayer book um, prescribed the use of the wedding ring, and the Puritans said there are no wedding rings in Scripture. And if you have a wedding, if you use a wedding ring or ex ex exchange rings, then people tend to think of marriage the Roman way as a sacrament, and to see the rings as the outward and visible sign which is part of the sacrament. And then the prayer book said that the clergy officiating in public worship should wear a kind of white tent called a surplice. They still do in Anglican churches, as perhaps you know. And this was thought bad by the Puritans, not only because it wasn't in the scriptures, because, but because it tended to put a gap between clergy and congregation which said the Puritans is unspiritual and unhelpful. And then the prayer book prescribed kneeling to receive the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine. Um, kneeling as a gesture of reverence, but the Puritans complained about that because they said it isn't in the Bible, and it tends to encourage continued belief in the superstition of transubstantiation. And fourthly, the um, prayer book prescribed that in baptizing infants uh, you pour the water on their forehead and then you make the sign of the cross with your finger in the water. And they said the, the Bible doesn't prescribe that. Uh, and the essence of um, the outward sign in baptism is not that you make the sign of the cross but simply that you pour water over the candidate. Uh, and by the way, that's good theology, let me tell you that. Um, as uh, has sometimes been said, it's the little bit of water on the top of the head that counts. Uh, Baptists achieve this by immersion, and Presbyterians and Anglicans and others achieve it by pouring water over the head of the candidate. Uh, not a great deal of water, but the symbolism is achieved when only a little water is poured. And some Latter-day Presbyterians have, have I think, um, uh, muddled the situation a bit by sprinkling the water and saying that it represents the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Well, if you read Romans 6 and Colossians 2, you find that going under the water signifies the end of an old life, and coming out from under signifies the beginning of a new one, and that's what baptism is all about. Um, so, so that's... Uh, what was being discussed in the decades before Geary wrote about the old English Puritan who made the word of God the rule of his worship and so objected to these four ceremonies. I continue to read. 
He, the old English Puritan, highly esteemed order in the house of God, but wouldn't under color of that submit to superstitious rites, which are superfluous and perish in their use. He made conscience of all God's ordinances, though some he esteemed of more consequence. You'll note the old English Puritan has, already, has dealt first with public worship, which the Puritans always regarded as more important than private devotion. That may shock you, but they did. They believed there was more grace given in public worship than in private devotion. They saw private devotion and personal Bible reading as supplementing what the people of God should be receiving in the godly life of a godly church. But that, by the way, um, he made conscience of all God's ordinances, though some he esteemed of more consequence. He was much in prayer. With it, he began and closed the day. In it, he was exercised in his closet, family, and public assembly. Family prayer was a Puritan invention. And uh, a precious one, I think. He esteemed that manner of prayer best, where, by the gift of God, expressions were varied according to present wants and occasions. In other words, there was room for extempore prayer, as distinct from simply using set verbal forms. Yet he did not, no, but he did not account Wait a minute. Yet he did not account set forms unlawful. It was a case of both and for the Puritan, set form and extemporary prayer both. Therefore, in that circumstance of the church, that means in the circumstance in which he lived in the church, he didn't wholly reject the liturgy. That's the uh, prayer book pattern of worship. But only it means the corruption of it. Now here's an, a further point. He esteemed reading of the word an ordinance of God, both in private and public, but he didn't account reading to be preaching. Why, you ask, should anyone see need to say that? Well, because uh, in the Elizabethan era, the Puritans had screamed to the Queen and to Parliament for more preachers and therefore more money to train preachers, and they'd had a dusty answer every time. And in probably the majority of churches, um, at most worship services, there was no sermon. And one line of apologetic, which defenders of the Anglican order had uh, widely used, was to say, well, now, wait a minute. When the word of God is read in the lessons, or whatever they're called, they're called lessons in the prayer book, um, that is preaching. That is God preaching. That's what the phrase word of God implies. Holy Scripture is God preaching. If you heard, hear the word of God read, then you've heard a sermon from the highest quarter. To which the Puritan response, of course, was to say, well, that's not what we meant. But that was what the Anglican said. Richard Hooker makes quite a bit of this point. Do you know the name of Richard Hooker, great defender of the Elizabethan settlement and his laws of ecclesiastical polity? Um, well, he's just one person who made much of that argument. And says Geary, the old English Puritan appreciated preaching, and he didn't regard that argument as speaking to his concern, so he rejected it. He didn't account reading to be preaching. Though, let me say to you folks, the argument that uh, the reading of the Word of God in public is preaching by God is, I think, a sound argument. And you and I who read the Book of God in public should always read it in a way which shows that we know that God is speaking here. I'm simply his mouthpiece. Uh, God is the one who is presenting these things to the congregation. Um, I must read, therefore, uh, as one who acknowledges the solemnity of what I'm doing. I say that because in this modern world, there are a lot of people who read the scriptures in public as if it was, a, uh, as, as, as if it was some kind of chase, you know, and the important thing is to get to the end of the passage before you run out of steam. 
if you read scripture as the word of God, I mean, if you read it with the sense that this is God preaching, you'll, you'll, re you'll take it more slowly and you'll read it with more emphasis and you'll make it your business to bring out everything which you can see that uh, God wants to underline. Uh, but I mustn't pursue that. Uh, where are we now? Yes, he accounted perspicuity the best grace of a preacher. Perspicuity is an old word for clarity. And he accounted that method best, which was most helpful to understanding, affection, and memory. Understanding means you've got it clear. Affection means you're excited about it. Memory means you can retain it. The Puritans had that threefold aim in their own preaching, and they were very good, actually, at uh, achieving all three goals. Now it's the Lord's Day, Sunday. The Lord's Day, he esteemed a divine ordinance and rest on it, necessary so far as it induced to holiness. He was very conscientious in the observance of that day as the Mart Day of the soul. Mart is market. Um, the social background is that in every, um, every town and village, there would be a market day when everybody who had any produce to sell would bring it in and it would all be put on show in the center of the town, the village, and people would do their shopping for the week. As now they try to do, we try to do, all of us at the supermarket, which has brought back pretty much the Puritan concept of the market day by having everything on show together. The mark day or market day of the soul is the day when, through use of the various means of grace, you stock up, as it were, in the soul, you stock up truth and wisdom and um, sources of support and joy and uh, knowledge of God and all the rest. You stock up, you reckon to be stocking up for the week, and then you spend the next few days uh, meditating on, brooding on things that you've learned, uh, things that you learned last Sunday in preparation, f uh, 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 well, not, not exactly in preparation, I shouldn't have said it that way, uh, as you look forward to what more you're going to get next Sunday. Uh, that's part of the Puritan perspective, Puritan way of life. Then the old English Puritan was a Peter Baptist, and this is the next thing mentioned, the sacrifice of, sacrament of baptism he received in infancy, which he looked back to in his age to answer his engagements and claim his privileges. That is to say, he took on, in a conscious way, the identity which a person who has been baptized and received the sign of the end of the old life and the start of the new one should do. Um, and he sought to live as a new creature in Christ, and he let the, the uh, knowledge that he'd been baptized spur him on to do this, answering his engagements and claiming his privileges as a new creature in the Lord. The Lord's Supper, he accounted part of his soul's food to which he labored to keep an appetite. He esteemed it an ordinance of nearest communion with Christ so requiring most exact preparation. Puritans were strong on the thought that uh, you should prepare to receive the Lord's Supper by spending a so little extra time in self-examination on Saturday night so that uh, you're realistic about yourself, your needs, and your commitment when you come to the Lord's table next day. You don't come just casually because the service is there. Then on we go. He, he accounted religion, this old English Puritan, an engagement to duty. Duty is a great Puritan word, you'll find. That the best Christians should be the best husbands, best wives, best parents, best children, best masters, best servants, best magistrates, best subjects, that the doctrine of God might be adorned, not blasphemed. His family, he endeavored to make a church, that is a fellowship of believers, both in regard of persons and exercises. 
admitting none into it but such as feared God. Eh? What's he talking about there? Oh, the, extend, uh, the, the extended family, which includes servants. Um, the persons you admit are servants. You, every, every home would have at least one servant in those days. And the old English Puritan uh, sought a Christian servant or servants. Um, admitting none into it then, but such as feared God, and laboring that those that were born in it, that's his own children, might be born again to God. He was a man of a tender heart, not only in regard of his own sin, but others' misery, not counting mercy arbitrary, that is something which you don't have to do, you just do it if you feel like it, but a necessary duty, wherein, as he prayed for wisdom to direct him, so he studied for cheerfulness and a bounty, that's a 17th century word for generosity, a bounty to act. In his habit, in other words, you see, he was generous. He was a philanthropist according to his means. And that was a big part of the old English Puritan identity. Um, I shan't have time to talk to you in any detail about the philanthropy that went on in Puritan England. Suffice it to say that there was a great deal of it. Then finally, in his habit, that's the Latin habitus, which means the clothes you wear, as well as meaning the, um, how can I say it, the customs which your uh, character, into which your character leads you. This is clothes. In his habit, he avoided costliness and vanity, neither exceeding his degree in civility, that means dressing above his station, nor declining what suited with Christianity. Uh, in other words, he dressed modestly as distinct from immodestly. Uh, which is, I think, you'll agree, uh, a weighty point about dress and one which uh, needs to be heard and pondered in many quarters today. Uh, desiring in all things to express gravity is a phrase that gets to the heart of the Puritan mindset. Gravity doesn't mean that you never laugh or crack jokes. In Puritan biographies you find that uh, they were often described as witty men with a great deal of cheerfulness about them, uh, people whom it was fun to be with. But gravity means that you take life seriously because of the seriousness of it, the eternal issues bound up with it. And then this marvelous three lines that finish off. His whole life he accounted a warfare, pilgrims in conflict, remember, wherein Christ was his captain and his arms prayers and tears, the cross, his banner, and his word, that means his motto, vincit qui patitur, he who suffers wins. And this is the end of part two of the presentation. We've come right up to one o'clock. So I'm not going to invite questions on anything that I've said since, we, since the break. If you have any questions, note them down, and we'll begin tomorrow by my asking you whether there are any points from today that you still want to raise. But read once or twice over John Geary and get on the Puritan wavelength, brothers and sisters. That's your homework for tonight. And um, if you want to start reading, well, I mentioned John Brown's book, but I really think that my book, sorry to be talking in the first person singular, my book, Quest for Godliness, gets you into, onto the Puritan wavelength quicker than other books do. So that's the only book that I'm going to recommend at this moment. Tomorrow we'll say more about other books, but for the moment, you've heard what I've said, you have your recommendation, you're uh, champing up a bit for your lunch, okay. For the moment, it's all over. God bless you. See you tomorrow.